Okay, so like, oops, this is easy. Um, I'm too much. Um, so, uh, um, first I should ask if there are questions about the final paper. No, okay. All right. So we're starting this book known as the second inquiry, an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. Um, and the main question of this book is, what is the true origin of morals? That is, um, there are some actions and characters which we think are entitled to praise and others we think are entitled to blame. Um, that's, that, that's what we're trying to explain the origin of. Right, so this is in section one on page 16. Um, we shall consider every attribute of the mind which renders a man an object either of esteem and affection or of hatred and contempt. Every habit, habit or sentiment or faculty which if ascribed to any person implies either praise or blame. Um, so apparently the, the only distinction between moral attributes, the only thing we're leaving out is things that are not mental, right? So in other words, if there's like a physical character or faculty or whatever that entitles you to praise or blame, we're not going to be considering that. But if it's any mental attribute that entitles you to play, that we feel entitled to play, praise or blame, that's part of the subject matter we're taking in here. And um, um, and what we're asking is, this is what he means by the origin. Um, we're asking, what is it about the characters or actions that determines which way we decide? So like, what do all the praiseworthy ones have in common? And what do all the blameworthy ones have in common? Um, um, now, I mean, this can be, right? So it doesn't mean origin in the sense of what's the history of them or something like that. Uh, it means, although Hume does have some things to say about that here and there, but what he's interested in is, the existing distinction we have between praise and blame, what's it based on? What are, what are the traits based on which we assign praise and blame? Um, and I mean, in a sense, this could be a bad question in that there might not be one answer. That is, there might not be one thing that all the praiseworthy things have in common. Um, and like, in fact, that's, that's what Hume is going to say. Actually. I mean, he's, he's going to say there's one main uh, principle, but then there's several others. Um, we're mostly reading about the one main principle and not the others. Um, but um, so like in that sense, it could be a bad or imprecise question. And in, and in fact, in that sense, Hume does think it, it doesn't entirely succeed. It doesn't end up being just one answer to it. But um, but it can't be a bad question in the sense that like we actually do make these distinctions. We actually do praise some things and blame others. <laughs> there must be some way we just so maybe we can't give a completely unified account of it, but we must be able there there must be some way that we're knowing which things to praise and which things to blame. And we should be able to find that out. So um, 
So that's why, you know, this thing at the beginning, when he talks about how no one can sincerely deny the reality of moral distinctions, what he means is, um, so, right, moral distinctions are real. What this means is not that they're real, let's say, in the sense that the primary qualities are supposed to be real, that something objective corresponds to them, or something like that. That's not what we're asking here. It just means they're real in the sense that they they um, have a subjective reality. We actually do make these distinctions. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's why he's able at the beginning of section one to like deal so quickly with someone who would deny this because you know it's not denying the objective reality of moral distinctions it's de denying the subjective reality of moral distinctions and that really is pretty hard to do. Okay, so there really are moral distinctions and therefore it's a good question what are they based on? And Hume says, um, this is back on page 16, this is a question of fact. Right? That is, it's a question about matters of fact, not about relations of ideas. Um, it's an empirical question. Therefore, according to Hume, right? How can we settle questions of matter of fact? Only by experience. So um, it can't be settled by abstract reason. So it's an empirical question. And the method we're going to use is the usual empirical method, according to me, at least what he thinks is the usual empirical method. Um, now, I mean, There's something a little confusing about this. I, I hesitate to go into this because as usual in these cases, I'm afraid that by talking about it, I'll just make it more confusing rather than less confusing. But it raises important issues. So, I mean, or like raises questions of what positions Hume has actually considered and what he has silently just written off. So, like, Um, there's two questions about moral rationalism, I guess, that you might ask, right? One is, um, is the origin of our, is the true origin of morals um, something that we discern using the faculty of reason? And to that, that question, Hume um, discusses briefly in section one and then says, but we don't have to go into that farther because when we determine what the true origin is, we'll have the hits of the pain. So, you know, so I don't want to write this, but This is the question. So one thing you can mean is right, the empirical answer to this question, according to a moral rationalist, would be um, that the origin of morals is something we discern using the faculty of reason. That is, when we find something and we want to decide something, meaning like some character, action, whatever, and we want to decide whether it's praiseworthy or blamable, 
we um, we engage in abstract reasoning to find out. And like the opposite to moral rationalism in that sense is sentimentalism. And this is the question that Hume discusses briefly, again, at the beginning of section one. Is it, is this right? Or is it the way we decide by feeling some sentiments? Right? So we want to know whether something is praiseworthy or blameworthy. We consider it. And if it's praised, yeah. and we praise it if it raises a certain sentiment. Um, and we blame it if it raises the opposite sentiment. In us. So, um, So as you can see here, that um, in this case, reason like it doesn't necessarily just mean relations of ideas. It's the broader sense of reason, right? It's any kind of theoretical faculty. Right? Like if this was empirical, if we if we decided using empirical reason, that would still be opposed to sentiment. Sentiment means it's not thought, it's feeling, right? But thought includes both thought about relations of ideas and thought about modest effect. Um, um, and in that sense, Hume says, that, you know, I mean, he kind of hints that the right answer is going to be a compromise between these two, but the compromise really leans in the direction of sentimentalism, right? So the compromise is going to be, well, we may have to reason about something for a while in order to see it in its proper light, but then the final decision is going to be made by sentiment, right? So, um, and the argument for that is, this is on page 15. Um, um, inferences and conclusions of the understanding of themselves have no hold of the affections or set in motion the active powers of men. They discover truths, but where the truths which they discover are indifferent and beget no desire or aversion, they can have no influence on conduct and behavior. Right? So anything that aims at discovering truths is going to fall on this side and is going to be subject to this argument that, that this merely establishes belief. Um, it's not sufficient to motivate action. What, like, why do, why is, it have to be strong, it have to be aimed at motivating action because I guess, like, I guess this is clear. Why we praise and blame them? I mean, it's supposed to somehow be related to getting people to do the praiseworthy things and not do the blame, right? So, um, um, so if the way we, so we couldn't possibly decide it just by ending up with some belief. We have to end up with something that causes desire or aversion, and that's going to be sentiment. Um, of course, um, human a stricter mood is going to say that belief is a sentiment. <laughs> um, and moreover, that the way that precisely the way belief differs from like fantasy is that belief has a stronger effect on our actions. <laughs> um, but I think um, he's making a finer distinction here. You know, 
Belief is a kind of sentiment, but it's a special sentiment precisely because on its own, it, it leaves us indifferent to the, the thing that caused the sin. Something else has to accompany it to cause the siren evolution. Um, so the thing about it having a stronger effect on us is, you know, like he said, where the truths they discover are indifferent, they can have no influence on conduct and behavior. But where the truths they discover are not indifferent, then they have a strong influence on our conduct and behavior, right? As opposed to the fantasy where you um, can discover something that would um, or invent something that would cause strong desire or aversion, but as long as you don't believe it, it won't affect your action. So um, uh, that was kind of a digression. Um, um, but um, so the point is, so um, in this sense, Hume is not a rationalist, meaning not that he's an empiricist, but he's a sentimentalist. And the people he is reacting against, he portrays as um, believing on empirical grounds <laughs> that reason is the answer to this question. Um, right, because before he raises this issue, he's already defined th this question as an empirical question. So whatever answer these people give will have to stand up to an empirical test. Um, I mean, so, like, by the way, in fact, the empirical tests in this book are mostly thought experiments. <laughs> um, why? Because, like Hume said, um, uh, these sentiments are so strong and universal that the philosopher need only look into his own breast. <laughs> right? So all I have to do is imagine the situation and see whether it causes um, praise, whether, whether you respond to it with praise or blame. Um, but anyway, so that kind of quasi empirical method, there was a, I want to say this is the onion, but I don't, it was not in the onion, it was in some other satirical, but there was like a thing about uh, um, a scandal because Sal, Sal Kripke admitted to having uh, falsified the results of a thought experiment. <laughs> <laughs> you know Sal Kripke is? You know. Famous philosopher, he did a lot of thought experiments. Anyway, so like, <laughs> So that the idea was like, you know, been determined that you didn't really have that reaction to the you know. <laughs> so um, right. So that kind of quasi-empirical method, that's how the question is going to have to be addressed. And um, and these people, and he mentions a bunch of them, Montesquieu, Malbranche, Cudworth, Clark. Um, Clark was Newton's. Friend who wrote the Newton side of the Leibniz Clark correspondence. But anyway, um, uh, these are the moral rationalists that he's debating with. Um, and um, and he thinks he can answer them by showing that, as a matter of fact, this is not what motivates people's judgments of praise and blame. Now, but you might construe moral rationalism as meaning that um, The answer to this question is to be achieved by reason. 
right? That is, if you want to know the true origin of morals, it's not an empirical question. It doesn't matter what people actually praise and blame. That's irrelevant. Um, um, and moral, is, moral rationalism, in that sense, Hume just assumes it's false. Yeah. Right? Or I mean, he just asserts that this question, that this, that, that this question means what do we actually praise and blame? What do they have in common? And there, there isn't any other question here, he implies. Um, but you might think that that a real moral rationalist would be like would be like this, right? I mean, like Kant is definitely closer to this. Um, in fact, if you ask Kant, you know. Do, uh, does the moral law actually motivate our actions? And if so, how? They'll say, um, we can't know if that's even possible, theoretical purposes. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, and they'll also say, meaning, among other things, including, among other things, the fact that I never know if I acted from moral motivation about myself. I can't even know that it's possible for me to act from moral motivation. So, right, that, that's not the rationalist that Hume is um, um, Hume probably thinks that that's ridiculous on the face of it. Um, but like he, he doesn't he doesn't address that at all. All right. Other questions about that? I'm going to erase this. Um, so in any case, um, like what it shows that Hume takes this to be an empirical question is that um, if, as Hume says, he says this on page 14, the end of all moral speculations teach us our duty, then what Hume is doing here is not obviously aimed at that. Right, like, um, because he's gonna take, you know, he's gonna take as data what we actually praise and what we actually want. Um, and he's gonna try to fit his theory to that data. So um, this doesn't involve him making his own judgments about what things are to be praised or blamed. I mean, it does and it doesn't. It involves him making them because he's looking within his own breath for the evidence, right? But it doesn't involve him like asserting them to us. <laughs> he just uses them as examples. Um, and we're supposed to be doing the same thing and using them as examples. Um, and in fact, um, in section two on page 17, so this is another example of a Hume's technique that I've pointed to several times before, I think, um, where he says, so, right, he's talking about the virtue of benevolence. So there, there's two big virtues <laughs> that um, they're going to be accounted for by the main, main answer to this question, benevolence and justice. Then there's a bunch of other ones. <laughs> so these are two big ones, benevolence and justice. And he starts discussing benevolence he starts saying, like, how great it is. <laughs> I mean, first he's just like gathering evidence about it, but as he goes on, um, he starts to like paint a picture of the benevolent person, man, as he says. And then suddenly he stops and says, but I forget. <laughs> 
that it is not my present business to recommend generosity and benevolence um, or to paint in all their, in their true colors all the genuine charm of the social virtues. These indeed sufficiently engage every heart on the first apprehension of them. And it is difficult to abstain from some sally of panegyric as often as they occur in discourse of reasoning. But our object here being more the speculative than the practical part of morals, it will suffice to remark blah blah blah. So speculative. Right, this is speculative is Latin for theoretical in this Greek language. Um, speculatio was the translation of theoria. Um, speculative versus practical. And here he's saying, like, so first of all, when I say it's a it's 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 example of technique I was talking about before, like as if so he's saying. Whenever I start to talk about this, I can't restrain myself from like praising these virtues. But like he can't restrain himself from writing it down, copying it over, or sending it to the printer, no longer, you know, right? I mean, it's it's again, it's a fiction, right? Like it's as if we're hearing him talk right now and he's literally forgotten what he was doing and started to say something else. But, but again, like, of course, if he really forgot what he was doing, he could have just erased that and come back, right? So, um, so, so this is like a little drama he's giving. And a little drama is to, um, at least part of the point of it, is to drive home this distinction where he's saying, um, my business here is not to recommend that you be benevolent and just but only to explain why people give praise to benevolence and justice. And why meaning like, um, not what is it good for, but like, what are the traits of benevolence and justice that make them pick those out as, right? So it's this theoretical as opposed to the practical part of morals, which, by Hume's own account is like somehow like is not the main part of moral. Because the end of all moral speculation, he said on page 14, is to um, um, teach us our duty. Not doing that. Well, so like so anyway, so one thing he's doing with that little drama is to, to drive that home. The other thing is, as we'll see towards the end of the book, he suddenly turns around and says, oh, but maybe I ought to figure out how to recommend virtues. <laughs> and then what he says then is unexpected. <laughs> All right, so, um, so, but until we get to them, that's what we're doing here, right? So like, so Hume isn't um, himself praising or blaming him. Um, He's just talking about um, what is the principle by which we we ordinarily assign praise and blame. And <clears throat> so not to keep you in suspense, right? The main answer is the main answer is social utility. Right, the characters that we praise, and he mostly talks about characters rather than actions. In the book, although he implies here that you can go back and forth between them. But the main, the characters that we praise are the ones we consider useful to society. Um, Which society? So, and this this is actually really important to his argument to notice this. 
with society, not my society, but the society of the person who has the character or carries out the action, right? So when I praise a character, someone's character, I'm doing it according to this main answer. Now, again, there's also other reasons, but the main reason is that I do it because I consider that person to be useful to their society, whatever society they're in. So like, for example, if that person's society is at war with my society, then I might be like very upset that they have a virtuous person. Um, but that isn't supposed, isn't supposed to affect my moral praise of it. I mean, in real life it will, but Hume says we, we, we consider that a distortion, right? Like you were not able to make the judgment clearly because you were biased or something like that. But like in principle, um, when you're making these distinctions correctly, you're, um, you're the thing that you're trying to focus on is the utility of this person's actions to their society, even if it's irrelevant or even harmful to your own society. So, I mean, I think like this is the first example, maybe the main example of what he means when he's talking about the role of reason in making moral distinctions in the earlier discussion. So back on page 15, right, he says, I mean, he compares um, moral judgments to judgments of beauty in some of the fine arts, where he says, in many orders of beauty, particularly those of the finer arts, it is requisite to employ much reasoning in order to feel the proper sentiment. And a false relish may frequently be corrected by argument and reflection. So, like this is an example of how that can get started, because um, what you're trying to do is um, get to the sentiment you'll feel when you consider the social utility of the action that is the poor character, that is the person's character to their own society. Um, so like the sentiment is going to make the distinct the, the decision in the app, so to speak, right? You're going to feel um, uh, uh, um, sentiment of wanting to praise this person or something like that. But, to, but it won't be the right sentiment unless you're careful to, you know, control for, um, various things, and that's where a lot of reasoning and argument can come in. So like if we're arguing about whether someone is virtuous, you know, I can say, well, that, you know, that person is nasty. They did X, Y, and Z to us. And you say, well, you know, but if someone on our side did X, Y, and Z to the other side, you would say they were virtuous, right? And thereby I can start to correct my sentence. Um, That is, I, I, it, make, I can, it makes sense to say, like, that person doesn't seem virtuous to me, but I may be biased. Um, so, um, so notice, like, this is not a form of hedonism. Right? It's like, I'm not praising this person because I'm going to get pleasure from their existence. I mean, of course, if they seem praiseworthy to me, then I will get a certain amount of pleasure from considering. I guess that's the sense, something like that, right? But that's not the reason, that's the effect. Right? This, it's not that I'm praising them because I get pleasure from them. I'm, I get pleasure from them because they're praiseworthy. Um, but so, but the underlying state of affairs is that I may be getting pain from them. Um, 
and all the other answers, the secondary answers that that Jim proposes also have that feature because they're all they're also always relative to um, either the person themselves or the person's society, right? So like. And one of the reasons we phrase certain things, traits, characters, is because they're useful to the person who has them, right? Like temperance or prudence, um, which it's a little weird that those are secondary examples. Those are like among the cardinal virtues, right? But now in Hume, they definitely are, you know, minor compared to benevolence and justice. Um, so, you know, and like the other two basically are instead of involving utility, they involve immediate pleasure, right? So, you, something that's useful is something that you can use as a means to get pleasure or as a means to a means to get pleasure or whatever. Um, but it's something that's immediately pleasurable, doesn't, it's not a means to anything else. So, like, for example, if you list um, having a good sense of humor as a virtue. And he says, yeah, I mean, this shows how broadly the virtue is being drawn because we wouldn't necessarily call that a moral virtue normally, but we would praise it, right? I mean, it's praising someone, at least in his culture and in our culture, maybe not in all cultures, this is a worry, right? But at least in his culture and in our culture, you're praising someone when you say they have a good sense of humor. So that's a virtue. That's one of the things, characters he's talking about. And he says, in that case, it's not because it's socially useful, but just because it's immediately pleasant for the person around you. Um, so, and then there's also some that are immediately pleasant for the person themselves. That's that feels bad. All right. Um, So, um, so, but anyway, in this, so in this main case, society plays an important role, and it's the society of the person we're judging. Um, um, however, there's also a second way that society is going to play a role. Um, and it's not so clear yet, but we'll see it more in the reading for next time, that Hume, when Hume tries to explain why these characteristics give rise to plays, praise and blame. So that's already taking on a somewhat different question. He starts to say, you know, um, well, is, that answer, is your answer to this question plausible, Hume? You know, my answer is it's because of social utility. And then I say, wait, but why does social utility make us feel a sense of wanting to praise or blame? Um, which, I mean, it's a good question because, again, social utility, it might not be useful to me. It might be harmful to me, or it might be, we might be talking about someone who lived a thousand years ago and they have nothing to do with it, or an imaginary person. Fictional character, right? We still have these sentiments of praise and blame. Um, why? Um, so when he starts to answer that question, um, he says that it's due to the interactions in society that we come to recognize social utility as the right basis for praise and praise and blame. In that case, of course, it's not the society of the person we're judging, but our society. Um, and in that respect, um, the makeup of society is important. So, for example, here's what he says, page 17. He's this is part of the panegyric to benevolence, but before he stops himself. It must indeed be confessed that by doing good only can a man truly enjoy the advantages of being eminent. 
I, I think we would say only by doing good can a man truly enjoy the advantages of being eminent. But being eminent means like being a noble or something like that. The, having an exalted station as he puts it. His exalted station of itself, but the more exposes him to danger and tempest. Wait, is that what you want to the word Oh, it's up here. It's about the same thing. Exalted capacity, undaunted courage, prosperous success. These may only expose a hero or politician to the envy or ill will of the public. But as soon as the praises are added of humane and beneficent, blah, 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 right? So he's saying that like a politician or hero can have all these other things like courage and whatever, and that can expose them to envy or ill will of the public. Um, but uh, if they're if you add benevolence, then the public isn't going to envy them or ill will because that you know we like that. <laughs> or as Thoreau puts it, this is from the uh, first chapter of Walden: philanthropy is almost the only virtue which is sufficiently appreciated by mankind. Nay, it is greatly overrated, and it is our selfishness which overrates it. So, like, what we're assuming about society is that it's mostly consists of the public, and there's only a few politicians or heroes. Um, and it's the interaction of these people that's gonna that's gonna produce the answer to this question that we're interested. In. So, uh, I like, I mean, I'm emphasizing this because. It's like this way of looking at it is going to be rejected by, for example, Nietzsche, but also by Thoreau, I think. Um, right? I mean, they're, they're going to say, yeah, of course, this bird, of course, what they praise benevolence. It's their own selfishness that praise it. Um, but that's not what we should value. Right. Or at least not the way they think of pronounce it. For both Thoreau and Nietzsche, it's a little more complicated. But um, anyway, so but, uh, um, okay. So anyway, that was just something I wanted to point out about the other way that society secretly comes in. Here. Um, so the method of answering this question, as I said, is going to be to collect the main examples of the virtues and vices, but he mostly assumes, I think, that if he can explain virtues, that is characters that we praise, that will also explain vices, that is characters that we blame. So they'll just be the opposite of each other. Um, so we assume that everyone more or less agrees on what these are. And as I said, we assume it so strongly that we're able to do this empirical investigation in our armchair. Um, however, it's not true, according to Jim, that everyone agrees completely on these judgments. And in fact, he often will use the variability of moral judgments as data, right? Either between different situations or between different people or different societies. Um, the, he uses those as a kind of controlled experiment. Um, so like, um, um, so therefore, you know, I mean, on the one hand, 
if there wasn't some agreement about these, his method is not going to work because his method really doesn't consist in taking a lot of empirical surveys, right? Asking people, you know, which way would you throw the switch of the trolley? <laughs> like sample size equals 10,000. Yeah. Um, he's, he's mostly just thinking about himself. But if there's some variation, that's not necessarily bad for him. And in some respect, it, it's good for him. Right? Because he can because he can show that his theory will explain that. This, you know, so here this isn't a real example. I mean, that is it is a real example, but it's not a real example Hume discusses. But so, like, I mean, so here's something Hume does say. Hume says that the first that first of all, the virtue of chastity is approved of because of its social utility. Because it's important to uh, that we know who the father of the children is. This is a pretty popular explanation. Um, and he says, now, like this part maybe is a little bit, I'm not sure exactly how this is supposed to work, but he says, um, and moreover, this can also explain why there's a double standard between men and women, because um, lack of chastity in women is more likely to cause this confusion about who, who is the father. Now, I don't really understand that basically because there, there's going to be confusion about who is the father. A man and a woman have to be involved, right? I mean, but, uh, um, so I'm not sure exactly what he means, but, um, but I think, but what I do think is like, so if you went to him and said, Hume, um, we don't think chastity is such an important virtue anymore necessarily, and we certainly don't think there should be a double standard between men and women. I think Hume would say, well, you have birth control. It's not socially useful for you, so you don't raise it. Um, And then if you say, well, but Hume, you know, uh, we we really blame the double standard. You know, I mean, uh, explain it how you want. We blame it. So since you're arguing for it, we blame you. We don't like you. Hume will say, well, I never recommended it. <laughs> I was just explaining it. <laughs> so, right, so, so in that sense, like, um, Uh, which you might call moral relativism is, is like, it's not a problem for him. Um, as long as he's following this method. At least it's not directly a problem. I mean, he obviously still can and probably does get in trouble by trying to find explanations in what sense does this get him in trouble? It, it shows, like, his explanation fails the control experiment. Like, we have to choose the null hypothesis, right? Like, when he explains some universal thing, but it turns out it's not universal. <laughs> right? So, like, the example of sense of humor. Now, I mean, although this is weird because he's perfectly aware of that. Right, he knows that in certain like um, cultures, in certain circumstances, what he calls the gloomy monkish virtues, right, of like fasting, uh, silence, humility, etc., are praised and, um, and like not um, these uh, pleasant virtues, like sense of humor. <laughs> um, Says, well, they are superstition as to serve the human nature. Um, but okay, maybe he can sort of explain that one, maybe, but I think, you know, there's probably a lot of others where, you know, like, he, I mean, he has a kind of cross cultural stuff, right? He's aware of various stages of British history, 
France, Greece, Rome, <laughs> like that's about it. So, I mean, actually, he tries. Sometimes he, in one place, he mentions the tenets of Zoroastrianism. <laughs> So he's trying, but it's not that hard. So like he probably does get in some trouble with that. But in any case, that's the method. We assume that, that these things are more or less universal. We sometimes take notice that they're not, but then we try to use try to explain that as well. And I mean, and basically, like so the way this method is followed is not by by like as it might have sounded from what I just said kind of Baconian induction where you just like mindlessly collect example after example and then try to figure out what they have in common. You know, um, we don't know how we got to this, but he's, you know, as soon as he starts talking about it, he's got a theory on the table and he's testing. Um, and, the, and the theory to begin with is this one, right? So with those two virtues, um, um, justice, benevolence and justice, he, his main point is to prove in the case of benevolence, he wants to show that a big part of the origin of benevolence as a virtue, that is a big part of the characteristics that, the characteristic that makes us Treat benevolence as something praiseworthy is it social utility. In the case of justice, he wants to show that its sole origin is social utility. And then there's a bunch more, as I said, relatively minor virtues, or at least he doesn't treat them as a great length. Um, that are collected together under the heading political society, right? And so that's where you mentioned like a lo loyalty or allegiance, um, uh, chastity, and a bunch of other things like having good manners and um, miscellaneous similar cases. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm mostly going to talk about these two benevolence and justice. Um, and the question is, what mostly makes us praise? So in the case of benevolence, um, again, he says, well, it's at least in part, in fact, mostly social utility. I mean, like if you ask what else is it besides social utility, I think that, um, for example, Hume, and he says this explicitly later in the book, thinks that being benevolent is pleasant to the person who's being benevolent. Um, so to a lesser extent, we may, these may, this may be one of the virtues that we praise because it's immediately present, pleasant to the person who has it. Um, but like, but the main reason is social utility. And how does he prove that the main reason is social utility? Now, I mean, one way he does it, this is sort of indirect, is by showing that we normally mention utility as part of our praise of someone who's benevolent. Right? So he says, that, like, if you want to praise someone as benevolent, that you will mention the good effects they had on their society. If, you know, if there's someone in an exalted station, this, this difference of rank. You know, this is something that like all the early modern philosophers take for granted that every society has. Um, I mean, of course, not that we don't have class distinctions, but it's not exactly the same as this. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's nobles and commoners, whatever. There's people in exalted stations and people in, and like in Britain in this time, the, Nobility is not like this is something that Hume like discusses at length in the history of England. The ancient Saxon nobility was mostly killed off in the War of Roses. <laughs> uh, that, sorry, the ancient like no, Norman nobility, right? 
the ancient Norman nobility, like the the like if you look today at a list of um like uh I don't know noble lines in England or whatever, most of them go back to the 17th or 18th century, not farther. Um so there was actually was a lot of mobility in the like there were all these people who were like started off as commoners, but they were favorites of the king. And so they were first promoted, and then promoted again, and then eventually became the Duke of something or other. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so like it's a, um, but what's there are their nobles. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's like a, a station in society that someone can be put into. So anyway, if someone's in that a station like that, then their benevolence will have wide effects in the society. If they're not, then it will be probably just affect their friends or whatever. But still, either way, this is what you're going to mention when you phrase them. I guess this is true. I'm not even sure this is true. How do you usually phrase someone as being benevolent? I don't know. Any, I mean, the examples he gives don't sound exactly. Um, in displaying the praises of any humane beneficent man, there was one circumstance which never fails to be amply insisted upon, namely the happiness and satisfaction derived to society from his intercourse and good offices. And then he imagines what we'll say. To his parents, we are apt to say, he endears himself by his pious attachment and duteous care. His children never feel his authority, but when employed for their advantage. With him, the ties of love are consolidated by beneficence and friendship. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe we just don't engage in kind of child stuff. Yeah. What about someone who like incites non benevolence in someone else? Or like. Well. Or like is benevolent and then chooses to not be benevolent. Like, how. Well, I mean, so what do we really say in those cases? Uh, I guess is it know. is it still just comparing like the social utility of those two different like? Oh, you mean well? So this is why it's important that we're talking about the character. Mm -hmm. it's mostly talking about characters. I mean, I guess there's there's at least three things you'd be talking about: person. Right, like judging whether the person is playing praise really or blame worthy. And I I mean he does like in this case he brings up an example like that. Number two is actions, and number three is character traits. Right. So like he's mostly thinking about character traits. So in the case of character traits, like um we're not kind of adding up the actual amount of of benefit to society. We're just asking, is this the kind of character trait which benefits society? Um, and I guess, I mean, I guess it's the same with persons as well. So it's not like when we, we're trying to decide whether someone is praiseworthy or blameworthy. Again, if we correct for bias, we're supposed to decide based on their tendency to be, you know, useful to society. Not based on the actual like number of useful effects they have. So, like, I mean, although this is all about utility, it's not utilitarian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, utilitarianism is not just trying to explain, but it's trying to recommend. Okay, so it's a completely different type of moral theory. But beyond that, you know, this is this utility. We aren't using it to, to reach a calculation of how useful something, right? So, like, you know, 
someone who a benevolent king is going to have a lot more good effect than a benevolent common. But they may be equally deserving of praise because they equally have a tendency to benefit society. No. And yeah, I mean, I think that's if that's what you're asking about. So, so that also means like if a person changes from benevolent to not benevolent. I mean, I guess like sometimes we say, unfortunately, that person used to be praiseworthy, but now they're blameworthy. Other times we might say um, that person seemed to be praiseworthy, but now it turns out they were blameworthy all along. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, it depends exactly what we think happened. But 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 one way or the other, it's going to be about the what we think their real tendency to be socially useful is, and whether it's changed. Not about adding you know. So I mean, because I think what you're asking is like if they suppose they they were benevolent all this time, and now they were not malevolent a little bit of time. So there were all of these. You know, there was all this social utility and then a little bit of not. Shouldn't we like keep praising them until this gets big enough? But but yeah, I don't I don't think he 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 uh is committed to that. Okay. Um so anyway, I mean that's kind of indirect evidence of that, right? I mean, like that was a I mean, I guess, well, no, maybe it's good evidence from his point of view. Because the point is, when you praise or blame someone, you're, um, I mean, I guess, again, in the long run, you're trying to get other people to act like that person or not act like that person. But um, in the short term, you're trying to get other people to praise or blame that person. Right? That is, when you, when you express your praise or blame, right? You're trying to, you're trying to persuade people to also praise or blame. Um, so you're going to mention the characteristics. If there's certain characteristics that cause you to want to praise them, you're going to mention those in your panegyric. Hopefully those will cause other people to want to praise them. So, um, but he also gives some examples, um, which are of the type I was talking about before, where it's kind of like a change in attitude towards a certain activity, um, type of action, I guess is what we're talking about. And maybe it's not true that he mostly talks about character. He certainly gives examples of all different kinds. It doesn't mark when he's moving from one to the other. But so in any case, like certain types of action that um, at one time were thought to be virtuous, um, or at one time we're thought to be vicious, and now our, we've changed our mind. And it's supposed to confirm the theory because it's supposed to be clear that we changed our mind because we changed our mind about whether it's socially useful. Now, I mean, the thing about these examples is that none of them is un uncontroversial, and Hume must know that they're not uncontroversial. <laughs> in Hume's time, right? So like, here's one of them, this is on page 19. Um, can anything stronger be said in praise of a profession, such as merchandise or manufacture, than to observe the advantages which it procures to society? And is not a monk and inquisitor enraged when we treat his order as useless or pernicious to mankind? Right, so like there's, I mean, I guess there the change is only implicit. You have to know that people used to despise merchants and manufacturers and praise monks and inquisitors, right? So, um, so like by implication, you know, it's because we that's because we used to think monks and inquisitors were socially useful. Um, now, you might ask, why do we think they were socially useful? Because they're like praying for us or something? I, I don't think that's the main thing he's thinking of. Again, if you read what he says about in the history of England, the monasteries used to be places where you could go and get a free meal, <laughs> right? Like a monk had a duty of hospitality. Um, and people used to think that was very socially useful. Because like all beggars could go to the monastery and get fed, whatever. Um, so, but then they realized that that's not socially useful. 
that it like promotes idleness, you know, whatever. Um, so I think this is um, kind of the same as another example he gives about giving alms to common beggars, right? Like someone asked you for money on the street and he said that used to be thought virtuous, but now we've come to realize that it's not virtuous. And um, And his other example is tyrannicide. Um, right? That is killing a tyrant. He says ancients used to think that was really virtuous because they thought it was so socially useful that here's a tyrant that's causing people all this trouble and you kill them. But later, when people realized that this practice actually makes all the other tyrants worse because they're afraid they'll get assassinated, so they become even more oppressive. Um, uh, you know, we developed a horror of this, and now we regard it as vicious. Well, again, obviously, he knows not everyone agrees with this. Um, I mean, you just have to read his discussion of the gunpowder plot in the history of England. Right? I mean, obviously, some people think that uh, uh, tyrannicide is virtuous. Possibly, I mean, you remember Locke was uh, suspected of being involved in a, in a plot to assassinate the king. <laughs> so, uh, certainly his associates were involved in it. Um, okay, so therefore, these examples, it's a little weird. It seems like Although officially they're being used as examples to prove the point, he's also trying to teach you something about giving on to beggars and tyrannicide, which is right? That he's actually trying to push his, his view. Um, so that leaves the case of benevolence a little bit. I mean, like on the one hand, the case of benevolence, it's not that hard, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's not strange to say we approve of benevolence because it's useful for society. Maybe that's why he's able to engage with all this other stuff. He's going to give a really strong argument for it. Um, in any case, the arguments in the case of justice, I think, are more interesting and more complicated. Are there questions about anything I just said about benevolence? I wish there were more people here and more questions. But they don't require attendance. I can require attendance and I can require everyone that, you know, I can say, so and so, what's your question today? <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I can't do that. All right. Anyway, going back to Hume. So, justice. Um, what Hume means by justice is it's basically about property. Right, as he put it, like, what is mine and what is yours? So it's, I mean, it includes also things like keeping promises, uh, fulfilling contracts, which I guess is a kind of keeping promises. Um, right, that it's not only material property, but other kind of rights you can have against people. But that's basically what he means by justice. Um, it's also like that's also the topic of the doctrine of right, or to be translated as doctrine of justice in Kant's metaphysical morals, the Rex Lara. Um, uh, it's about stuff like that. So, um, so, so that's the virtue that he wants to show that we praise only because of its social utility. There's no other reason to, that, to regard justice as praiseworthy and injustice as blameworthy other than its social utility. And how does he try to show that? Well, basically, he gives a lot of examples of cases where justice wouldn't have social utility and claims that in those cases we, we're not inclined to praise 
So all these, most of these examples are kind of wild thought experiments. Um, right? So like one of them is a society that have enough of everything. So, I mean, like really enough of everything. Meaning, as, as he puts it, that like, if I have something, like let's say I'm about to eat this tasty fruit that just fell into my hand up from the tree, and you come and take it and eat it, all I have to do is reach up and I'll get another thing. <laughs> right? So why should I care? Your fruit, my fruit, it doesn't make any difference. And Hume says, I mean, I think, I don't know if there's a case where this distinction causes a problem, but, but there is a there is something to notice here, which is that the example isn't from what the people in this society would crave and want, the fictional people in this society. It's like what we're inclined to praise and blame when, we're, when we think about it. So when we think of that society, Jim says, right? So imagine someone in that society, and now they say, um, <laughs> when I was given, when I was doing this lecture at home over Zoom, there were protests at this point. <laughs> they said, now they say, no, I want that fruit. That one's mine. And I said, well, you know, like my kids sometimes do. <laughs> More when they were younger than now, but still sometimes they do it like they <laughs> There's a point when they were both really into collecting these plastic horses. And it wasn't kind of, I mean, because I'm kind of more me than my wife, I'm kind of a softy about stuff like this. And we're like, can we get more plastic horses? And we're like, okay. So it was kind of a situation of abundance. There were lots of plastic horses. They still are. They're, they're all over the house. But you know, so there were cases where they would both have the exact same plastic horse. Right, like the same model from Schleich horses, right? So Schleich, well, I guess it's not just horses, they have all kinds of plastic animals. But anyway, so they would have the exact same one. So they would either notice some tiny difference, like, oh, but this one's closer, a little bit more worn down, or they would actually mark it. Because they because the worst thing would be if the other one got to play with their horse. <laughs> Right, so I mean that's something we can imagine happening in the society where they have enough of everything. But do we consider it praiseworthy? Is the question, right? Like, do we consider it praiseworthy to make a distinction between what's mine and what's yours in this situation? And I think it's at least Hume is is not going too much out of limb to say that no, in that situation we don't consider justice to be praiseworthy. Um, I mean, I, you know, like I give that example, I think, or I, I give that example of the plastic horses or whatever, I think to show, because he maybe doesn't in this case, in some of the other cases he does, in this case doesn't maybe go far enough to show that there's something to even talk about, here, right? You might think in that society, justice would be impossible. Like there's no such thing as justice because there's so much of everything. But, um, um, but in fact, you could still try to observe rules of property. It just wouldn't be praiseworthy. <laughs> right. So um, that's one example. Another example is the example of the society that's maximally benevolent. So, right, so in this society, everyone looks. Um, you know, cares for everyone else's interests exactly as much as they care for their own interests. So although they don't have like a super abundance of everything, um, whatever they do have, they, you know, like I never worry about you taking my stuff because I know you wouldn't take it unless you needed it more than I do. And if you need it more than I do, I want you to have it, <laughs> right? So, um, um, so again, in that society, Hume says, um, there would be no use for property, and therefore we wouldn't consider it praiseworthy. Um, 
I think there's some weird things about that example that maybe show some of the limits of Hume's thinking about this. I mean, yeah, doesn't that doesn't that relationship like depend upon justice? Like, in order to have like the ability to be like, oh, I want you to have it. You know, that, that seems like the essence of justice. Well, no, I mean, actually that's important. So again, justice is about property rights. So um, that's why it's a different virtue from Bonobo. So like justice means what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. And I will respect what's yours. It doesn't mean I'll give you anything that's mine. That would be benevolence. So, um, um, now, I mean, you might think, so like William Godwin makes an argument like this. William Godwin is, uh, among other things, he was Mary Wollstonecraft's husband, but that was later in life. Also, father of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, but that was also later in life. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, he was like known as the father of anarchism. Very interesting, actually. I taught some of this stuff in the grad seminar last year. Um, and, you know, I mean, he has an argument that basically it's a utilitarian argument. And you know he's basically a utilitarian, although he's before that people would usually think of utilitarian. And you know, I mean, his argument is that uh, justice prescribes that everyone be given like what they deserve. Um, and like so, like as 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 he puts it, I you know every um, thing I own is only held by me in trust. And my duty is to dispose of it in a way that will lead to the maximum benefit to the people who most deserve it. <laughs> so, so it turns out that justice, like, merges into benevolence or takes the place of benevolence, right? Because God would say, that like if I give something to someone just because I'm feeling nice, that's injustice. I should be doing that calculation to the best of my ability. Anyway, sorry, that's kind of a kind of a side note or something <laughs> or introduction to a different course that I'll never teach. Like an undergraduate course that has William Godwin in it. <laughs> Maybe I will, who knows? But so anyway, um, right. So no, so this this society of universal benevolence is not based on justice. Did you also have a question? Yeah, I just um wanted to like say about justice. Um so would you say like the social utility um from justice is like it derives from its way of handling disagreement? Between yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? He discusses three different um, modes of distributing goods, right? So assuming we're not in this society of, of you know, great abundance, and we're going to have to split up the goods somehow. He says that, like, if you ask a rational being who had no experience of human nature, what's the best way to do that? they would say, well, obviously give the most goods to the most virtuous people because they'll do the most good with them. Um, so um, Hume says, well, that sounds good in theory, <laughs> but in real life, um, it's not that easy to tell who are the most virtuous people because First of all, it's just hard to tell. And second of all, everyone's biased in favor of themselves. <laughs> so in reality, that system would be disastrous. And everyone recognizes that when it sometimes appears, right? So he mentions that there were these 
there were people during the Civil War in England who, um, you know, there were various wild religious sects going on as part of the Civil War. And there were people who believed something like this, right? They said that like dominion belongs to the saints. They, they should be allowed to take whatever they wanted because they were saints. <laughs> And he says, you know, the civil magistrate treats them like common robbers. <laughs> and rightly so, right? So that, that, that's proposal number one that sounds good, and he rolls, rolls it out. And he says proposal number two, which seems a lot more plausible, is let's divide them evenly. Let's divide everything evenly. And he says, you know, that seems plausible, both because it seems like it might be possible to do that. Like, we, you know, we don't have to make any difficult determinations about who's virtuous and who isn't. And also because he says, like, in our actual situation, um, if you uh, were to divide everything evenly, everyone would come out pretty well. Whereas in the current situation, where some people have a huge amount, other people are starving. Right, so he says, like this seems this system seems to recommend itself, but then he, um, this is similar to the, the worry we saw declare voicing in the other course of teaching that like um, think of the type of control you need over society to make sure that no one ever gets more than anyone else, because as soon as you divide it evenly, people are going to go right back to trying to accumulate. And you're going to have to keep evening it out. Um, and he says, I mean, he says a number of things about that. And the main thing he says is, like, if you gave anyone that much power, they it would soon degenerate into tyranny. <laughs> so therefore, it's like third best, but the only one that's actually practical, he says, is something like our current system of property rights. And yeah, so it's like. It, it it settles disputes over what belongs to them in, in as peaceful a manner as possible. Um, um, so uh, um, without giving anyone too much power or whatever. Um, and he thinks that's evident, at least if you think about it. Right again, he makes a little bit of reasoning. Once you once you go through the reasoning, you're supposed to feel the sentiment. And he says most people know this. You know, like is that um, um, like you know, like Marx would say. Well, of course, most people you know have that sentiment, Hume, because you're all bourgeois <laughs> capitalists, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that's not the sentiment that people in a communist society, right? I mean, anyway, uh, um, but I mean, but uh, like there is some reasoning involved. In it. It's not, he's not just saying it, it's exactly the way he promised it's going to, or a promise, yes, that it's going to work. <laughs> uh -huh. So, uh, Another example is the example of society that, oh, I guess I should say one other thing about the society of maximum, or actually there was a couple of things I was going to say about it. One is that it's not clear that we only divide things, that we only draw a line between mine and yours for the purpose of like keeping you from taking stuff that I wouldn't want to give you. I mean, like his example of people, two people who have fields next to each other. And he says, why should they mark them off when neither one of them cares if the other one takes their produce? But the thing is, like, someone's got to plow the whole field. So, like, um, uh, if we don't divide it up, then there's some chance that I'm going to think that you'll plow this part, and you're going to think that I'll plow that part, and it won't get plowed. <laughs> right? So, like, there are other reasons for um, inventions of property uh, 
promises, contracts, whatever, other than just guarding against someone else's greed, right? So that we need to like rearrange things to make sure they get done properly. Um, you know, like similarly in this society, this is something that Godwin has trouble dealing with too. Like in this society, um, suppose we want to meet to have lunch and like we could be here or we could be here. So like if I promise you I'm going to go here, then you'll know to go here and then we can have lunch together. But if I break my promise, um, then we, uh, I don't know, maybe I can work on this, the details of this example better. Um, but right, yeah, so if I break my promise, then we won't be able to eat lunch together and we'll be worse off. So like, um, or no, I guess I put it this way. If I don't promise anything, yeah, that's the right way to say. If I don't, if neither of us promise anything, we want to have lunch with each other. So we both have the other's interest in mind as much as our own. Well, what do we do? Well, chances are I might head to this one and you might head to that one. And we won't be able to have lunch together, right? So whereas if we had made a promise or a contract, and I mean, if we're having lunch together, maybe it doesn't have to be that formal, but you can obviously imagine other examples that are more, you know, if we had a promise or a contract, then we could avoid that bad outcome. So, you know, so it seems like there is a virtue to keeping promises, even in that society. Um, there's also this question, which is, um, does everyone always want what's best for them? Or does everyone always agree on what's maybe a more neutral way to put it? Does everyone always agree on what's best for someone? So like I may think what's best for me is one thing and you may think what's best for me is something else. So in this society of maximum benevolence, I can count on you to do what you think is best for me. But that may not be what I want because I don't think that's best for me. So um, like I think what this points out is that Hume is, is ignoring the issue of like what we might call procedural justice, right? That like there's a value to, um, or there's a reason for wanting, um, um, you to have to respect my rights. You know, like to be a clear line of who has the authority to tell me what to do when, even if I think that everyone has my best interest at heart. Yeah, so, like, I mean, most of those things I'm just saying, maybe they don't affect the core of Hume's argument because I think they might point to the idea that there is a role for justice in this maximally benevolent society, but at the same time, it also would make it praiseworthy. So, um, but it, but like I said, it does maybe show the limits of what Hume is calling justice, and how carefully he's thought about it. Um, probably his strongest case is the case of a society that doesn't have enough of anything. Almost everyone's going to die, no matter what we do. So he says, like, and the other, the other, the ones who survive are going to be miserable. He says, like, in that case, we don't praise someone for being just, right? So example, after a shipwreck, he says, you know, like, suppose I'm, like, everyone's drowning and I see a suitcase floating by. I'm, I'm not supposed to check the luggage tag to make sure it's my suitcase, right? <laughs> we wouldn't praise that. <laughs> um, like I said, that's a pretty strong example. That seems to be true. I mean, you might disagree with him about why it's true, but it seems like that seems to really be true. <laughs> um, on the other hand, the weirdest case, I mean, there's some others I'm not going to talk about, like the virtuous man who's flunked down into a society of rough men. Right? I mean, actually, that one's also pretty straightforward. It's like, he has to arm himself, he says. And like, you shouldn't worry, like, who does this sword belong to? But um, 
But the case that's that's like disturbing but also really interesting is the case of the really weak people. There's also a case of really strong people, but I think that's less interesting. The really weak people. Um, so um, were there a species of creatures intermingled with men? which, though rational, were possessed of such inferior strength, both of body and mind, that they were incapable of all resistance and could never, upon the highest provocation, make us feel the effects of their resentment. The necessary consequence, I think, is that we should be bound by the laws of humanity to give gentle usage to these creatures, but should not, properly speaking, lie under any restraint of justice with regard to them, nor could they possess any right or property. So obviously this is disturbing, right? Like, what are we talking about? These these people who are so weak that Hume says it's still virtuous to be benevolent to them, but it's not virtuous to be just. Because, like, it won't cause any disturbance in the society if I take their stuff, because they can't resist. Now, I mean, I don't know if this makes it less disturbing or just moves the, the source of disturbance away from Hume and closer to us, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, like, I think, so first of all, it's important to know that, that he says that their inferior strength, both of body and mind. Right? So, like, it's not just um that um they can't fight back when I try to take their stuff. It's that they can't, like at least as I understand this, it's like they can't represent themselves in court. And it's pro that's probably the more important side of it. Because the example he gives, and the only example he gives that a like positive example he gives is. This is plainly the situation of men with regard to animals, meaning non-human animals, obviously. So we have the situation of humans with regard to non-human animals. And how far these may be said to possess reason, I leave it for others to determine. But actually, he himself determines it somewhere else, and he says they do possess reason. <laughs> right? So, like, um, Right? He disagrees with, with anyone who says that that's the difference between humans and non humans. Um, so that's really a good example of Herbert Hitler. And, um, and I think you can see in that case that, yeah, you should be humane to animals, but does it make sense to talk about keeping contracts with them or like um, respecting their property rights? Um, I mean, if we wanted to respect their property rights, um, we would have to appoint a human to represent them. If not, like if it's possible for a chimpanzee to represent itself in court. There's some kind of joke about this on the internet. I don't know. Um, but anyway, if it's possible for a chimpanzee to represent itself in court, then I think, like Hume is right, at that point, all of a sudden, there'll be no question that it's praiseworthy to be just in this sense with the chimpanzee. But where we're saying the chimpanzee is pretty rational, <laughs> but someone else is going to have to speak up for it. And I think like that's the more important part because a chimpanzee is actually fairly strong, right? Like if I wanted to like physically take away its stuff, I probably I wouldn't be able to. But that's not the point because like you know, as Hobbes points out, that physical strength is always like you can always make up for it for, for, with greater numbers or cunning, which is how we get to take some stuff away from chimpanzees, right? 
<laughs> like so um we built these cutting devices you know, whatever so um um so it's so like i said there is something disturbing there of course <laughs> um like okay so what's going to happen if if we don't have to be just to the animals is that really going to be socially useful in the end and it turns out well to what society for one thing <laughs> but um uh but like Jim's example maybe isn't as disturbing as it looks you know he says that when Europeans came to America, they were tempted to think because of their technological advantage that they were in this situation with respect to the Indian. And therefore they abandoned the standards of justice when they dealt with them. But um, clearly he thinks they were wrong. That was blameworthy. Um, it's the chimpanzee case that he would put in the press, I guess. <laughs> All right, that's all I have time for. I will see you next time.